Well, we'll just you know, talk about. I just talked about. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's so exciting. Is our beyond? Mm -hmm. Okay, Krista, um, what you said you were deciding to be vegetarian, and what kind of led you to that decision? Um, so, it was really about me trying to um, really. I've I've dealt with chronic illness, and so. Um, trying to find ways that weren't about medical intervention um, that would allow me to live a healthier life and a more full life. And and so in my reading and Googling and hearing from other women who have experienced some of the same, same things that I've experienced, one of the things I came to that was this factor of meat in the large scheme of how my body may not process meat well. Um, and so my parents were actually doing like a fast, um, the called the Daniel Fast or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had decided to try it out. And then I was like, well, I'm just going to cut meat out. And I actually had intended to do it temporarily. And then I just felt amazing. Like it was like a <laughs> complete 360 mm -hmm. shift. And a lot of the things, a lot of the symptoms of my illness kind of dissipated. Um, I lost about 35 pounds when I stopped eating meat, which was not my intention, but it was cool. <laughs> um, but like that opportunity to just feel better, um, it it really was radical change. Um, and I think for me, it I don't know if I'll continue to just be all the way vegetarian. I dibble and dabble as well. Like I said, I cheated um, this week, but I do know that now I'm highly aware of how much I eat. Um, my portion sizes got smaller when I started just eating plant-based foods. Um, I didn't crave food so much, like I wasn't eating all the time. And I think it's because when I stopped eating meat, I also stopped eating as much processed food. Um, and so my meals became very much about like some set of vegetables and um, maybe rice or something um, like that. Um, a lot of soups, a lot of greens actually. Um, you know, potatoes, things like that. Um, and so now I eat a, a much smaller portion. I get full really fast, which makes me mad on days like Thanksgiving where you're supposed to have like four <laughs> plates. <laughs> um, and I can only have one because I'm like, oh, this isn't sitting well. Um, but yeah, that was kind of what directed my decision was trying to identify ways to, to really shift what was happening with my body in ways that didn't involve pharmaceuticals or surgical surgical options and things like that. Because mm -hmm. I have been down that road for some years now. Um, and it gets tiresome to be in a kind of cycle of, um, of illness and, and not know how to respond to it. And so food is a, a big part of how you can start to change that. Um, even mental health, like I, I noticed a significant change in my mental health when I um, went to a more plant-based diet. Um, and now I'm even learning about what foods create stress, what foods uh, can alleviate stress. Um, you know, it's just, once you start to investigate the food you're eating, I think it's just like this world opens up and suddenly you're, you're aware of like, even if you make the certain decisions, like we were talking about the Big Mac earlier, which I have not made that decision in some years. <laughs> <laughs> but when you make those decisions, you make them consciously, as opposed to just kind of being this zombie that just eats whatever is available or in your space. You're like, you know, can should I eat this ice cream? I know what this ice cream does. I know what it's made out of. I know how it affects my body. Uh, if I choose to make that decision to do that, I know what the consequences are and I'm not doing it without having information. And I think that's the freedom and the, uh, what Diane was talking about, the equity is to be able to really understand what it is that you're eating um, and the power of that and be able to know, you know, if I'm, when I have a cold, I know what to make. Like I make the same, I make like a um, hot cabbage stew or I'll have, a broth stew made with, like, I know what to do to kind of treat myself. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a cool thing that's happened since I became vegetarian, um, is that I'm kind of just more aware of what I'm eating. Do you think that you're getting um, support from 
sounds like your family was doing this fast. Do you get support from your family? Do you get support from your neighborhood? Or what could those people be doing to support you? Um, I definitely think I got a lot of support and understanding from my family. And my family has all been, all of us have been kind of on a journey of becoming healthier and um, making better health choices, um, becoming active. My Both of my parents have become very physically active which I think is awesome. My dad, like, bikes to work sometimes, and he runs, and he's been in some marathons now, so um, mm-hmm. it's pretty awesome. Um, so I feel that support, and also just from friends. Like, um, now the big thing is, me, my friends and I love to go out to eat, but now it's always like, can Carissa go to this restaurant, though? Because <laughs> I'm going to make sure she has some options, but I think it's goofy because you can pretty much eat anywhere. But, <laughs> um But it's cool that they're thinking about me and they want to help me continue on this journey and they don't want to mess me up or like, you know, like, I don't want you to go there. Um, So I I have had an amazing amount of support in doing this. And I think also just for myself, like I said, when I feeling feeling healthier was the impetus to like do this. And when I found that that's what I felt like, um, I think that that just really changed my perspective. Like, it was shocking to me that just literally in a few days I had this just miraculous difference. And I'm not, I'm not a, like, preaching vegetarianism or veganism to folks, but I do, it has made me talk to folks about, like, there are options for, you know, if you're, you feel like your digestive system's not working all the time, take a, take some time and just maybe move meat out of here or move starches out of your diet for a while and figure out you know what works what the balance is because I think everybody's body is different and mm-hmm. everybody's going to respond to different foods differently mm-hmm. um and it's not about shaming I think that's the other thing that you know we were talking about some some of the diet industry and um fats versus sugars and all of those things and a lot of that is about shaming people, shaming people about what they're eating and making them feel bad because they crave things that, of course, you're going to crave them because that's, they're created to like do that. That's what they do. Like You crave sugar because it's molecularly made to make you crave it. Um, mm-hmm. And you shouldn't feel bad about that. But if you know that that's what it is, you can make decisions around it. Um, and that, you know, being a person who has lived in a body that is not the traditional, like, thin, beautiful, like, uh, what people in mainstream will say. What what Um, white male supremacists have. uh... Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, I've lived through some of that shame, and I've dealt with some of those issues around eating. And now now that I know that I can eat, you know, a whole bowl of Brussels sprouts or a whole bowl of, you know, and that it's delicious and it's something I can eat. And I don't have to feel bad about it at all. Um, and if I do decide to eat some fried chicken or some, you know, turkey or whatever, um, I don't have to feel any kind of shame or um, be down on myself about that. And I and that to me is also valuable, just knowing what, um, being able to enjoy food. Um, and take pride in the food that I'm eating and take pride in the food that I'm making um, is important. And I think you feel that better when, when you are cooking your own food and when you're using whole foods. You like you just feel better about what you're eating and you feel better after you eat. And it's fun to prepare it because it's actual work and not just like pouring things from boxes <laughs> um, into a bowl and putting it in the microwave or something. So. I don't know if that answered the question, but... Yeah, no. Is there anything else you want to say about that, or vegetarianism, or anything else? No. No. Can I ask a question? Sure. That's really great. I I really appreciate that. That is an individual perspective. How do you feel about beginning the, the, the... process of sharing that knowledge with people who haven't don't have time have not had training to have the kind of experience you have it's the equity question again and I think that the equity question for me I mean that's the whole that's 
I try in my head to make that my bottom line. And I'm wondering how you think about that rather than from an individual perspective. Because that's how we were socialized to think. You know, it's all about me. How can that come out of you and be shared in your community? That's a big question. But um, I mean, I, I said this, or I think I've alluded to this. I think it starts with your family and your, your immediate circle and goes out from there. Um, when I made the changes that I made, I started sharing that within my own family network and with my coworkers and talking to them about what their experiences have been. Um, and, you know, in terms of, like, those that don't have access or don't have the information, I think there's always opportunities to speak when you're... Um, I think that's where I, I see the need for them more opportunities to gather. Um, being a person who's, I always say antisocial, I'm not antisocial, but I am kind of more reserved socially. Um, I sometimes need like uh, shaped opportunities to interact with people. Um, and when I have those opportunities and I get to know some like one, I have some one-on-one -on -one contact with people, um, I love to just start conversation and like, hear kind of where they're coming from and you know a person who hasn't had as much access to information about food or access to, or even lives in a place where there's access to healthy food for a while I lived on the north side of Minneapolis um on Fremont and I only lived in Minneapolis for many, for a year I'm a St. Paul girl all day mm -hmm. six five <laughs> uh, but living there I saw the, the extreme difference between, you know, I grew up in Midway, some of you, Frogtown, and we we do have kind of a wealth of food options around us. And living there, and especially being a person who doesn't drive, um, I had a roommate who drove, but I didn't have a car, and, and I was mostly, mostly using public transportation. Like, my options were very few, especially when it was kind of, like I was saying, if you run running to go get an onion, there was nowhere to run and get an onion. Like, that was a trip on the bus to, <laughs> to the closest grocery store, which I think is that, that rainbow or cub right on um, Broadway. Yeah. Um, and then you have, like, the Walmart, but that's another bus ride away. So um, that experience was really interesting for me because I don't think, besides when I went to Bethel University and was kind of out in the boonies, I had never experienced not having immediate access to the things that I needed. Um, basic things that I kind of expected, like the staples, like mm -hmm. um, not being able to go always to the grocery store to get what I needed, or even, you know, like go and get household things or those things. And so it did surprise me. Um, and I understood more that conversation around food access mm -hmm. and, and the limitations when you don't have that. Um, and, and that's where I see the, the marriage between transit option and, and food is when there's that limitation, how is transit supporting the ability of folks to get to where they need to get, to get healthy food, to get the items they need for their homes, to get the items they need for their babies and their families. Um, and looking at ways that, um, working in transit equity and transit adv advocacy, always remembering that component of access. Um, not just to the jobs and schools and um, health care providers, but also to food. Like, you know, one of the, the I remember one of the conversations when um, there was preparation for Green Line in the 16 was this conversation around how people will get to Midway to the grocery store. Because most of the people who live along um, this corridor go to Midway to get to the grocery store. And many of them are carrying those groceries back on transit. What does that look like on a train versus when they were riding the 16? Mm -hmm. That was a conversation, and, and, and it's a real one. Mm -hmm. And if you're walking, it's a difference between walking a half mile or a quarter mile to your train station and walking that one block from the bus stop that you mm -hmm. usually go to. That's a change. And so um, some it, it's, you know, as you were saying, there is always a political uh, aspect to some of these conversations because... Who does it benefit that now I walk a quarter mile rather than a block? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I live here and I've lived here and that 
bus stop has been available to me and now it's less frequently available to me. Um, and so really being mindful of how those things impact each other and, and then what development is happening along the green line um, that really supports healthy food movement and a people's access is another thing that I think, you know, that's where the TLD becomes married to this conversation. Like it's all layered together. Um, and, and I think as we become more holistic in how we think about things that um, transit is connected to healthy food and healthy food is connected to education, just like we were talking about, and education is connected to these really highly political conversations that are being had about what, how we spend money in our states and, and federally, like, that's where you, that education piece and really understanding what those connections are and what you can do in your little space. Like, I work for Metro Transit, and in my part of the world, what I can do is is really work for transit advocacy um, because that's what I know. And then folks like my uncle are working on getting people access to healthy food, and that's his part of the world, and, and we're working together. Um, and if each of us have that ability to work, it makes me think of that conversation about working towards peace. That's where we're doing it when we're figuring that out. Like, what is my little piece that I can do to push us further on that equity spectrum? Um, so yeah, I'm rambling now, but. No, I'm <laughs> loving it. it. And you're having exactly where, like yeah. I've been thinking about this with these meals. You know, yeah. if we can do a meal and if we can redo a meal, like are there people we can invite because one of the things that was so wonderful about the peace celebration and, and like people left it with a much clearer sense of how they do their part and how like they might not have thought of themselves as a peace worker, but then they could say, oh, I, I make peace through transit or I make peace through vegetables. So it's, I'm curious. One of the things that's been so fun during these interviews is hearing people talk about like the, the community wealth and mm -hmm. how much yeah, is how much. here. Uh -huh. And I wonder if there are people that we should be thinking of inviting who don't see that, you know, especially like the teachers in the schools. I'm thinking particularly like the health classes or, you know, people who who think of it as like a scarcity question, like how to get them to come and participate and see it from that side. Or even inviting mm -hmm. business owners, like, you know, this, the corner store system <laughs> um, that's in so many urban neighborhoods and particularly in, in communities of color, like having the conversation of connecting with them about how can you bring fresher options to this business that you have. And I know some of them are, are trying to do that and particularly you know, some of the stores close to here um, that, that are um, East African, Ethiopian, or Somalian owned, they have some fresh options because the community is, it desires that, and so that's what they provide. But thinking about, like, how can you connect those folks that you wouldn't be your first thought, but, like, they have an impact, mm -hmm. and maybe you can't get a rainbow there, but that little corner store is there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you connect them to some of the opportunities or that maybe even some of the networks of fresh food that are happening and say, would you be willing to share or sell these things in your store? Like mm -hmm. They are. And what's so very interesting is that some of them are going to Rainbow and buying food to bring to their stores or they're going to Costco and they're buying mm -hmm. food to bring to their stores. So they aren't, they're not part of that system where they can actually access the food easily. They have to go through, jump through all kinds of hoops in order to be able to have that food in their stores. And that is just bizarre to me, you know? That they, I, I see things in, in, say for instance, in Star Market. And I love, I love Star Market, it's right on the corner. I don't have to shop there. I go there on purpose to get certain things and then I notice the things that they have that they've had to go and purchase from a retail store, a larger retail store in their own neighborhood in order to have it there. Whew. Wow. Yeah, that's a good point. Like that's, yeah. Like we could be inviting, I don't know, like Big Daddies and the other people who serve these things to say, how could you get some of this in your neighborhood? Because in the last, so we did this meal with yeah. Asian Economic Development Association and a lot of the people who made the food had never thought about trying to buy food in the neighborhood. 
Yeah. So it was the first time I was high in music for like time harm existed, for example. And so. I just, yeah, and, and I, did you see about Sun Foods? Sun Foods and, and Star Ocean have, a, have litigation against them right now, starting because they actually were holding people almost in indentured servitude. They were doing terrible things to people and telling it. This is, I just saw this in the, it was in the strip today. And I, it was, it was put on the, um, put on Facebook by Bernie mm -hmm. Hess. Mm -hmm. And you, you, do you know Bernie? Bernie is UFCW. Mm -hmm. And he was on the Food Nutrition Commission. Mm -hmm. And he's a neighbor. He just lives up the street. And talk about food being political and treatment of people in the food system being horrible and things like that. These are all systemic things that have to change in the food system. Mm -hmm. And it just blows my mind. So, I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me because things have not really changed uh, since 1770-whatever. Uh, but it's interesting. I think a lot, how do we yeah. make these stories available to people yep. gently? Like in ways that don't re-traumatize them, but give them the opportunity to yep. say, but it could be different. Yep. Like here yep. are ways that it's working. I definitely, that's one thing. Yeah. You know, I was just having a conversation with a friend last night um, about like, we can continue to talk about what what the horrors are and the, and the barriers and the obstacles that we have, or we can talk about how are we going to dismantle these systems yes. that aren't working for all of us. Right. Um, and I think this recent election, like, a lot of folks were angry and depressed, and I, I was angry, and, and I was sad, but I also felt amazingly energized, because yeah. it was like, now I don't have to prove that we're up against something with the folks who are naysayers. It's mm -hmm. right there in your face, yeah. and if you choose not yeah. to see it, then you're actively deciding that you're going to be blind yep. to the injustices that are existing, yep. but now... I'm energized to move because you can't stop this train. I'm sorry, I always talk mm -hmm. in transit. <laughs> no, it's no, but uh, yeah. you can't stop it. Like you know, the the tides are moving, and you know, I can't off the top of my head remember. There's a quote that I keep um, at my desk. It's something by James Baldwin, and he talks about you know change and shifting and how um, it's inevitable and. Our world is shifting and people are understanding that unity and that concept of our, you know, if you suffer, I suffer. And, yep. and if yeah, you, yeah. all over the world, and I, I think social media and, and all of the things that have been able to connect people across the world are really, sh are energizing that movement towards like, we can do things. There have been amazing strides in the last eight to ten years in spite of all of the forces against them. Like, um, And so what can we do if we just continue to, to do what our part of, t you know, taking away at these, these things and um, whether we're inside of these systems working to change them or outside of the systems working to change them, they have to change mm -hmm. because... Yeah. If they're not working for all of us, then something has to shift. Um, they'll fail by themselves if they don't move with the tide of um, the folks who have decided that they want to live their lives differently and that they want their children to have different experiences than they've had. Um, and when you think about that in terms of food, you know, the food industry has been trying to catch up with people's new ways of thinking about food and new decisions around food and you know, they try to lie to us about certain things, but people now have become educated. And so suddenly a food industry, you have places like McDonald's that are trying to figure out how do we have fresh options? Right. For kids. Like yeah. Yeah, now all of a sudden they have an apple and the Happy Meal and things like Like we can make those decisions because it, it is a consumer society. So if we stop buying things or we redirect our, our financial energies to something else, that changes. I mean, that's our vote. I, we're not going to eat this. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there has to be a difference and, and they can get around it with some of the things that they do to kind of, you know, well, 
then don't eat and you can eat this really expensive mm-hmm. food. But that only lasts so long because people can decide, well, I'm just going to grow my own or I'm going to go here for this option or I'll just stop eating that altogether. Like there are things that I just don't eat anymore and it's surprising to me that I don't eat them, but it's like, it's not worth it to me when I want it to be organic or I want to know where it's sourced from. I have to spend too much. So I just won't eat that until it's available to me in a more reasonable way. Um, and that's a hard decision to make, but also it's it's my decision. And I think when people know it's their decision to decide what they're going to eat and what they're not, um, that's very empowering. And to know you have that power as a consumer to decide what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. A piece of what I've been finding really exciting in this is that, like, so for years now, they've been saying, oh, it's only 2% of the alternative food. Like, like... Main street food is all this, and, like, you people with your critiques, you can control, like, this small piece. But the more we're talking about greens, particularly greens, because I think they represent so many foods that people give each other, they have no idea how many greens are out there. They're outside the f- economy that they have accounted for. Under the radar. People don't pay taxes on them. They're, like, they're there. And so I think it helps to see, like, that whole ocean of food that people feed each other with is much bigger than anybody realizes. So as people realize the other system is broken, it's nice to say, like, the the boat that's not sinking is bigger than you thought. There's space for everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, that's very exciting. It will be mm-hmm. slow, however, because it's like, you know, you can you can turn a, a, a speedboat around on a dime, but you can't turn a battleship around on a dime. So the more people that know, you know, all along... That's why we can't be a battleship. We have to be a bunch of canoes. We, we do. We have to wrap it, yeah, but we got. But we have to. We have to have those canoes outnumber. I mean, have to weigh as much in in the mm-hmm. long run mm-hmm. as the battleship, mm-hmm. so that we can turn on a dime, mm-hmm. and the battleship just gets left out of the equation. Mm-hmm. That to me, I mean, that's a real revolution. Mm-hmm. Is getting everybody on board in some way or another. And, and it's like you said before, the way we do that is to reach out to one person and have that re- person reach out to another person. It will take time, and I hope we have the time. Half the world's food yep. right now comes from outside the formal economy. Yep, it does. Mm. Yep, cool. it does. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good and the people who are no, relying on that are no, have but enough. But we could, yeah, it's, it's, it's encouraging. It's encouraging and also... If people can understand how how spoiled we are, I mean, we get oranges at any time of the year. We can eat red strawberries any time of the year, even though we don't grow them here. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if we eat seasonally, if we eat closer to home, and if we forge these connections closer to home, there are people that are growing food all all over the place and learning new low tech techniques. For not always mining, Mm -hmm. because industrial agriculture isn't just another form of mining. Mm -hmm. It screws up the land, and that's been shown, you know, scientifically to be the facts. Whether or not people know that and understand it, 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 it's up to those, those of us who have that glimmer to share that glimmer as quick as we can and make sure that you know, you said you got really excited just about yourself when you found out how eating a little differently could make you feel better. That's the kind of knowledge that we have to be passing around. To me, that's the kind of knowledge we have to be passing around to our next-door neighbors. You know, high up on the street, talking to people we don't usually talk to. High up, you know. It ain't easy. We're not conditioned that way, but. Well, I know you're inspiring me, Carissa. Yeah. Because all week I've been calling chocolate a vegetable. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just to have less shame about it. Because <laughs> I've been eating a lot. So, but thank you so much. It, yeah. You, you this are one a smart fun cookie. conversation. Yeah. 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 Smeller. Yeah. Yeah. What the heck? You know.